Let's update you on the Slenderman case hearing happening today in Waukesha, Wisconsin, where a 21-year-old accused of stabbing a classmate to death nearly 10 years ago is now asking a judge to release her from a mental institution. Morgan Geyser and her friend Anissa Wire were 12 years old when they lured sixth grade classmate Peyton Lutner to a park after a sleepover. Geyser then stabbed Lutner repeatedly while Wire urged her on. I'm not making this up. It's a crazy case. During the two day hearing, experts have weighed in, some saying she is not ready to be released, and others saying she should get a conditional release. Let's take a listen to the judge's ruling. One aspect of the case, I think the court's in a position to rule, and I'll rule this afternoon with regard to the petition for supervised release. As was with the uh, doctors that testified, the court's been involved with uh, this case since the beginning. And uh, as is Mr. Sopakowitz and as, as has Mr. Cotton. So the, the history, uh, the anecdotal history of the case goes back for the length of the, of the legal proceedings on all sides and in all facets. The, um, just, a, just an initial comment. The, uh, the, the court uh, asked Dr. Pope to be available uh, from the beginnings in the event it was necessary that she testify. The, the issue of what happened, what happens at Winnebago at, for Ms. Geyser at this stage of her, of her tenure there has been in the case. Everybody talked about it, that there's no place else to go, there's nothing else out there. I thought it was necessary that somebody from Winnebago be here to tell us what it really is so we know what the status is. That's why I asked her to be present and she, she repeated, it didn't repeat, but she said what other doctors had said, that, it, that basically there isn't any place else for, from a remedial standpoint, not much else for, for Ms. Geyser to do. However, I forget which doctor it was, it may have been Dr. Collins or, or Dr. Lundbone, did state that what happens in a situation if Ms. Geyser stays at, at Winnebago is that they re-emphasize the therapy that she has and they work more diligently at it. So it's not totally an end of the line type situation. Parties should also keep in mind that as uh, it gets lost in the shuffle is that uh, the court doesn't have to accept any professional opinion. It's clear that the court can listen to what uh, takes place and but the court doesn't have to accept their final opinions. I look to the, uh, the, 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 the key case, not the key, well it is a key case, there's a series of cases in Wisconsin involving uh, Randall, Randall, State versus Randall. Allen, Aiden, Randall. The most recent decision of the case is at two, is at uh, 2011. WISAP 102, it's a 2011 decision, but Randall's been around since the mid-70s, 75, 1975, 76. He murdered, the bottom line is he murdered two police officers in a really vicious way in the course of a robbery and ultimately was committed and went through a number of, of um, petitions for review. And in, uh, I think at least in the 2011 case that, that's been cited, the most free, that's been cited, uh, it was his fourth petition for review. There are the, the, all of the, the, uh, Doctors testified, and uh, they three physicians, three doctors testified in favor of supervised release. The court denied it. So that emphasizes the point that the the issue of uh, experts testifying uh, still doesn't change the court's view that the court makes the final the final decision with regard to to to, uh, to, uh, to what occurs.
So I do begin my analysis of the case going to the uh, statute that's been cited, but I want to reemphasize what it says. It's in 971.17 sub 4 sub D. It says the court without a jury shall hear the petition within 30 days after the report of the court appointed examiners filed with the court. The court shall grant the petition unless it finds by clear and convincing evidence that the person would pose a significant risk of bodily harm to himself or herself or of serious property damage if conditionally released. In making the determination, the court may consider without limitation because of remuneration, the nature and circumstances of the crime, the person's mental history and present mental condition, where the person will live, how the person will support himself or herself, what arrangements are available to ensure that the person has access to and will make necessary medication, will take necessary medication, and what arrangements are possible for treatment beyond medication. And so that's, and that the, uh, is pretty well set forth also in the Randall case from 2011, which as I indicated is the most recent really substantive case on the issue. I did some, as all good lawyers do, I shepherdized it. And it's been, the Randall case was uh, referred to in two decisions, at least in two, earlier this year in 2024, but it's still good law. So now let's look at, the, at, this, at this case. First, the court looks at the, uh, what, what happened, the nature of the offenses, of the offense. This is, uh, you know, it's a brutal murder. The, uh, or there's a brutal attempted murder. The, uh, and another aspect of the case is that everybody involved, uh, the victim, the two assailants are all 12 years old, they're all kids. But, the, but Ms. Geyser and, and Ms. Weyer attempt to kill and wanted to kill the, 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 the victim. The reports show that she was stabbed 19 times in the body torso the, uh, you know, just and was left, basically left to bleed to death. It is fortunate that somebody came by and, and either saw her or heard her pleas and were able to get the authorities there, the fire department, the paramedics to save her. Otherwise, she would have uh, died. Now, what, there's a lot that can be said about that type of situation, but you think first of the, of the effort to uh, stab somebody 19 times. If you read the complaint and go through the history, you know, she's on the ground, the knife is going in 19 times. And it's uh, Miss Geyser that's wielding the, the, uh, is wielding the blade. But then the, the, she's not dead. But then they leave. And I, you know, the, the only consequence of leaving under those conditions is, of course, that she'll bleed to death. If they thought if they were able to think through that sophisticated maneuver, that she'd bleed to death and die, and the the, the posited justification for the attempted murder was to appease Slenderman and become one of his disciples. Thus, the defendants, Miss Geyser and Miss Wire, then had packed up gear. They left and they started to to walk up north to a, nas to a st national forest where Slender Man maintained his, his mansion and ultimately th they're apprehended later on on the, on the freeway. But that's what happened, so we can't forget what happened, the brutality of it, the callousness of it, if you will. Keep in mind that the defendants are young, they're kids, but that's what they did. And that, so that is a, a a coloring, if you will, an umbrella over what the, what the court has to look at in the case. Now we get to the, to really analyze the, <coughs> the, uh, 
the, the reports and the, I, you know, I've read the reports. They came in early in preparation for the hearing. I read the reports and I've heard the doctors testify. What is significant, and we, we've talked about it, but we can't, uh, we can't overshadow, we, we can't forget what those reports show and what the evidence presents. When we talked about the, the attempted murder, the rationale, if you will, for the attempted murder was Slenderman. That was the uh, impetus for it. That's why it happened. That's how the case proceeded. That's how the initial diagnoses came forward. Those were the operative facts, if the operative mental health facts, if you were, for the case. Now, the, the court is, I mentioned at the beginning of the hearing, ultimately, just to step back a minute, ultimately the court found the defendant uh, guilty and the not guilty of, by reason of mental disease or defect, based upon the statute, I committed her to the maximum that was available, and that was a 40-year commitment. Under the statute, she can a person can, can petition for a supervised release every six months. So this isn't uh, the only the only time limit is six months. So this judge knows the history being very thorough, and one of the things he'll have to consider is whether or not there's a significant risk to the community if Morgan Geyser is allowed conditional release. When we come back, we'll get you the ruling from this judge. Stay tuned, Court TV. Tonight on Closing Arguments, a case allegedly driven by money, sex, and power, the trial of Chad Daybell. Cult-like religious beliefs surround this defendant as he stands trial for three murders. And Morgan Geyser pleaded guilty to stabbing and killing a classmate when she was a child. Now she is seeking release. We have the very latest from today's hearing in the Slender Man stabbing case. Closing Arguments with Vinnie Palatan. Tonight at 8, 7 Central, only on Court TV. The judge in the Slender Man case hearing is just about to make a ruling. The defendant is asking the judge to be released from a mental institution. She's been there for 10 years since she was found not criminally responsible due to mental defect for the death of her own friend. Rather, she did not die, but for the injuries that the friend sustained after 19 stab wounds. Morgan Geyser and Anissa Wire were 12 years old when they lured sixth grade classmate Peyton Lutner to a park after a sleepover. Geyser then stabbed Lutner repeatedly while Wire urged her on. Let's take a listen to the judge's ruling. Talked about her now. So what we're faced with at this point is that Ms. Geyser is doing well in her program, that she's a, she needs socialization, she needs some outgoing, some, some further work in that regard. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect is her credibility is at, at issue. The, she's changed her position and her credibility as a reporter is at issue. That the credibility of the reporter is critical to what assessments are made, how people, how professionals, how mental health professionals make decisions. They're critical to how legal people make decisions. The credibility of the reporter is paramount because that sets, that's the factual basis, that's the factual foundation for what occurs. And when you put all of these issues together that I've talked about, all of these factual circumstances. We come back to risk. The dangerous risk is it significant in for the community. At this point, I'm this court satisfied that the credibility issue undermines Ms. Geyser's stay at the institution that until that credibility issue is resolved, that risk is high. We have two different versions in a way as to why the attempted murders were committed. And you know, this isn't just an aspect where somebody drove a car into another car and, 
and drove off and left him sit there. This is a personal, a personal, if you will, a brutal attack on another person. This is hands-on, if you will. This is bloody, it's gory. But that kind of risk, that kind of dangerous conduct is what the risk is. Do we know if someone will, will repeat it? We don't know. But what this court's responsibility is, is to be sure that the risk is lessened. So as the statute says, <clears throat> the court shall grant the petition unless it finds by clear and convincing evidence that the person would pose a significant risk of bodily harm to herself or to others or serious property damage if conditionally released. This court is satisfied by evidence that's clear and convincing that Ms. Geyser does pose a significant risk of bodily harm to herself, to others, or of serious property damage for the reasons that I've stated. Now, as she works hard, she continues to do what she's supposed to do, but that doesn't change this risk. Remember that uh, what the, the community's concerned with risk, dangerous risk. The community is concerned to a great extent as well with what happens to Ms. Kaiser. But the primary concern in the balancing, and we talked about balancing earlier, in the, um, in the Randall case, they talk about the balancing that goes on in the court's decision. The ultimate, det and the, the ultimate determination of dangerousness requires, requires a careful balancing of society's interest in protection from harmful conduct against the equity's interest in personal liberty and as well as autonomy. So that's the balance. But the balance is the public interest in staying away from harmful conduct. Under these circumstances, this court satisfied that the, that the scales tip in favor of the public, and it tips that way by clear and convincing evidence. So in this matter, after hearing all the credible evidence, which I'm satisfied was very well presented by uh, both the state as well as by the defense, I'm satisfied that the petition should be denied. So ordered. Thank With you. that, I'll remand uh, Ms. Geyser back to uh, the Winnebago Mental Health Institute. So ordered. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. The okay, court will be in recess. There she is, Morgan Geyser, being led out of court. Again, going back to a mental health institution. She was never incarcerated. She was found not criminally responsible because of her mental health. She's been there for 10 years. A perfect time to welcome and bring in our guest for the hour, criminal defense attorney, Darnell Crossland. Darnell, thank you so much for joining me. This case, near and dear to me, I've done child welfare for years, 12 years old when these two did this. Now, Slender Man was the articulated reason Credible or not, that's one of the things this judge had to consider. It just is pretty unfathomable to anyone that two 12-year-olds would stab one physically doing it, which was Morgan, the other one egging her on, and stabbing their own friend 19 times, leaving her to die in the woods. Someone came upon her. She's lucky so that she didn't die. What are your initial thoughts about the fact that the judge has said, no, you are not going to be released yet? I'm going to tip the scales based on clear and convincing evidence in favor of the public. You are staying at a mental health facility. Uh, yeah, you know, the, the problem I have is that uh, the judge's decision um, was very labored. Um, and I didn't think that he really gave any type of real scientific analysis. Um, he struggled with some case law that he was trying to extrapolate some precedent. Um, but at the end of it, um, it just boiled down to that he was not clear that she didn't pose a risk to herself and others. He was not convinced that she didn't pose a risk to herself and others. And I think that that was just his position. Um, he went on to give you a factual analysis of how bad the crime was itself. but. I don't think he did enough with the balancing. The balancing, when you look at Miller versus Alabama, which is a Supreme Court case that says youth um, uh, should not be sentenced to life in prison uh, as it violates the Eighth, Eighth, Eighth Amendment against cruel and unusual punishment. Now, this is a mental institute, 
And us in the field of criminal defense attorneys, sometimes we say it's better to get sent to prison because you will have a way out than if you go, go into some of these mental health um, uh, facilities. It's almost like you do life there um, and then the same rules don't apply. Um, so when I looked at this whole thing and I'm, I'm taking notes here on this, it just appeared that the judge uh, was, was feeling that that she uh, still posed a risk, but he didn't give us some light of day saying, you know, these are the experts' opinions, I considered them. He said, I don't have to take them, but I didn't hear enough of I considered them, and if she does X, Y, Z, then she would uh, probably re release. I don't see any, he didn't leave any pathway um, for release because if she comes back six months from now, he's, he's probably still not gonna be clear and convinced that she doesn't pose a risk. So he didn't leave an out for her to, to, um, to, to get out. And Darnell, I wrote down one of the things you just referenced is that he made very, very clear that under the law in the state, he does not, the court does not have to listen to the experts. They do not have to use that as a basis for the decision, which is fascinating, but that's the reality. So I think you're right. He made a decision based on what he thought the decision should be. And he did say he found it by clear and convincing evidence. Just for viewers, that's a lower standard than beyond a reasonable doubt, but the standard applicable in this case. I must ask you this, because you alluded to it, mental health institutions, the whole goal is for a person to get mental health treatment so that they can live in society and not be a risk to themselves or anyone else. And with the amount of treatment that should theoretically be available in an institution to treat someone who's only 12 at the time they enter, I wanna take that into account, 12 at the time they enter, 10 years later, 22, theoretically, do you think, Darnell, that a person should be able to have enough treatment that they can be released from a mental health institution and still continue to meet their mental health needs? Absolutely, that's a good question. And so the thing is, it's a quagmire. And I've had this as a criminal defense attorney. Um, if you're in a regular prison, um, not a mental health facility, then you get in the feds, you get the 85%. In, in the state uh, where I'm in, Connecticut, if it's nonviolent, you do 50%. If it's violent, you do 85%. But those are rights that are built in. So if you do X amount of time, you're going to get out on that schedule. In a mental health facility, it's sort of arbitrary. Like, who knows who's going to decide whether you're well enough? Um, and, and, and a lot of times, these things are privatized. So no one wants you to stop, uh, to, to get better so you can get out and they can stop, stop, you know, stop making money. Um, the beds are filled. They make money. So it's very, very tricky. Um, but the judge gave a precedential um, analysis that uh, four experts testified in another case, and the judge still denied it. So that he opened up by saying, if that, if those four experts testified and the judge denied it, I'm just letting you know that I could deny it too. And I knew he was going to deny it. So I don't find that uh, there's a real analysis here as to whether someone has gotten better or not. Um, there's nothing scientific to say, okay, here's a scale, they've gotten better. Uh, and by analogy, if you did 85% of time in the feds, you get out, or, you know, there's a schedule. There's just it's so arbitrary in this space with this mental health facility space. So, um, you know, again, Miller versus Alabama says people aren't, kids aren't hardwired, and uh, they go through different phases of, of, of being. So so to, to sentence somebody at 12 years old to 10 years and no light of day, that's not the same person that was back there. And so we really have to do better, I think, to understand Miller versus Alabama and understand that children, especially with mental health issues, not just regular children, but with mental health issues, uh, can change over some time. And I don't think we did enough in this case so far. And I do think that, you know, obviously mental health needs need to be met on an ongoing basis. The treatment may look different as you age and as you change, but mental health needs can be continuing that need ongoing treatment of some kind. There are lots of different options for that.